Hello. Thank you so much, and very much appreciate you coming back, and obviously our wonderful hosts and organizers. My name is Elan Kelman. I'm at University College London, but we are here to hear the panel, not me. And if I went through the distinguished bios of all three speakers, that would take up the entire time slot. So instead, I'm going to go immediately to them, simply by introducing them by name, also recognizing that we are looking at potentially going a bit into lunch to ensure that we give our three panelists enough time as well as you for questions. So immediately, please welcome Penny, who will introduce himself and his topic. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, kia ora ana, mālo i lilei, whakalo whātū, whawhetai, tālo whalawa. My name is Pene Huro Lefali. I live in Wellington. I'm also part, I'm also Samoan, so uh, I'm more international. But I'm going to talk about the issue here. This is my topic. I deliberately stay away from the climate change um, issue uh, for many reasons, but one dominates. Uh, the AR5, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, Fifth Assessment Report, is already out of date. So I don't want to relitigate the science that goes back to 2013. We are already moving to the AR6, preparing for that one. So. Uh, we cannot sort of like really use old materials. Science evolves a lot. The second part, I think most people are interested in the 1.5 degrees warming uh, special report coming out in two weeks. Well, hopefully coming out in two weeks because we don't know whether the government is going to accept the final draft or not. I'm privileged to uh, be a reviewer for the um, special report and I know exactly the message is there, but I'm not going to share with you because that goes against our governance uh, in terms of the science. Uh, so I decided to stick to what we observed in the year 2017 as a guide to the discussion here. This report you, is uh, compiled mainly by the American Meteorological Society, but a number of us involved right around the world. So it's more like... Um, the IPCC, but we do it just on a yearly basis to monitor exactly what happened during the, that particular year. This report just came out on the first of last month, so it's only a month old, and uh, this is sort of what we have right now in terms of the science. Uh, where's the, is this the one? You point it to... Okay, um, so um, the talk here, because it's only 10 minutes, so I'm just going to go through some of the essential climate variable changes that um, tells us about the climate. So this is um, the cover of the report, um, and it's particular, as I said, um, by the American Meteorological Society. Uh, it's in its 20th year of publication, and many of us, as you see in the map, um, involved. Uh, one of the the pointing thing about this report is most of the contributing authors and the lead authors are mainly from developed countries. Um, I'm one of the few in small islands uh, involved in the IPCC process, but that has to do with the, this, the capacity uh, context. Uh, so you can see the color sort of uh, tells you where most of the, at least the green one, for example, um, where the uh, country is contributing at least one author. So we do pretty well in New Zealand compared to our colleagues across the Tasman. Um, um, but that's uh, no, um, um, nothing to do with uh, rivalries uh, between us and Australia. Um, so the, this current report, there's a 524 authors from 65 countries, 19 editors on three continents. One of the things that distinguish this report from the IPCC report, we only talk about what happened, what we observe. So we don't pursue the attribution, which is really what you lawyers wanted to know, and I'm not going to go there. But we also don't go into the forecast. So the, for example, seasonal forecast, 
decadal forecast. And again, the lawyers and the policymakers very interested in the scenarios. So as you know, it's a seamless forecasting basis. Um, how many people understand the difference between weather forecasting and seasonal outlook and scenarios? Oh, that's this poll. So, so there we go. It's a problem right away. So I should have presented what I presented two days ago to the, <laughs> the workshop because he provided what I mean by the, uh, the seamless forecasting. So a quick uh, what we call um, class 101 <laughs> science here. Um, the seamless forecast is basically based on your time frame. So for weather forecasting, it's only up to 10 days. And the reason why weather forecasting, it's driven by the atmosphere. So the basic climate system is the interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean. So with weather forecasting, it's like a partner. The dominant partner is the, in the, the coupling is the atmosphere. So anything beyond 24 hours, like the data, that's no longer variable for um, meteorologists and weather forecasts. So those are the guys, the meteorologists, they're just interested in the chaotic nature of the atmosphere and doing weather forecasting. The next one beyond the 10 to 14 days is the seasonal outlooks, or in some cases there's no agreement, like in the US, for example, they call it climate forecasting. Back in New Zealand, we call it climate outlooks. We're very cautious in terms of like being too confident in our outlooks because it's the probabil probabilistic forecast. Then the next one is the decadal, and then you're moving to the 100 years and beyond, which is climate change. But you have to also know that between the first and sort of up to about the decadal, it's mainly driven by natural variability factors, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So a lot of these natural drivers of the climate, that makes it changes. So if somebody's telling me that uh, a hurricane that struck a country is to do with climate change, I'm really careful about that because I don't know whether they're talking about climate change <laughs> to do with natural variability or climate change to do with human-induced greenhouse gases. And that is one of the difficulties that we always face in the science community, in the IPCC. When we launched the report, the first IPCC report in 1990, I was there. Uh, I wasn't a leader for back then. Um, the, to help drive the negotiation of the UNFCC in 1992, um, we restricted our definition to both natural variability and human-induced. But when we got to um, um, Washington, D.C. in 1991 for the first Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee for Framework Convention, we spent three days, and I was sitting at the back, not realizing why we spent so much time on definition. And it was restricted by the lawyers to just human-induced in addition to natural variability. And that's why... In the science, we're still looking at both. And that's why the Conference of the Parties keep coming back to us in the IPCC and say, can you please define the dangerous level? Is it one degrees, 1 1.5, 2 degrees, 3 degrees? And we said, no, we don't know. We can give you a range of options. But our role is to provide policy-relevant advice, not policy-prescriptive advice. Very different to distinguish. And if we don't understand that, then it's very, very difficult in terms of negotiating moving forward. So that's sort of a quick rundown. I wasn't going to talk about that, but I think it's important that people know the difference. So I'm just talking here about the natural variability stuff. Um, very simple. That's sort of the key areas of the um, climate system. This is how we monitor. It's very expensive, and thanks to... Uh, the big developed countries without all the satellites, the, you name it, uh, we wouldn't be able to actually monitor and understand what's going on in the climate system. So my advice to lawyers, be aware of what the data you're getting or the advice you get because it has to be followed, agreed international uh, agreement in terms of how you define, for example, a baseline. 
a baseline in terms of like where you start to, to see where the trends are. In climate, for example, temperature, the WMO baseline is 30 years, and we define that. So any other person that uses outside of that, it's very difficult for us in the IPCC then to compare apples with apples. <laughs> and that's one of the difficulties that we always face as lead authors. Um, and once you come from, I brought up this picture. This is uh, uh, a small house in, in Samo. Uh, it's a beautiful beach where I go, and it's from my village. Uh, so um, it's the application. So you, you're moving from monitoring data to um, um, modeling, and then the application. So that's really important, that flow. Where uh, this is more complicated, um, not just the land, <laughs> as I put up. So these are all the, the fuller component of the climate system. Um, now, going to exactly what happened last year. By the end of last year, we were looking into, right down here, uh, we're in a weak La Nina conditions right now. Um, so the state of uh, the El Nino self oscillation really provides a very important context of what the, um, the report looks at at several scales. Uh, most people in, in our region, for example, in the tropical Western Pacific, the, the most uh, dominant uh, natural factor in driving the changes in weather and the climate is the El Nino self oscillation on a shorter time frame. But also there are what we call the convergence zone that drives the positioning of, of for example, cyclone. Um, so the El Nino, for example, if there's an El Nino conditions happening, we know from um, research, tropical cyclones in the upcoming season will be occurring from the dateline to the east of the dateline. So if you're living, for example, in Samoa, going towards uh, Cook Islands and French Polynesia, Tahiti, if you hear that we are calling for an El Nino coming, be prepared for it because there will be a higher probability of hurricanes and tropical cyclones occurring in that part of the region compared to the west side of the deadline, and vice versa with La Nina. And that's exactly like um, why it's very important when you're trying to do uh, climate change policy making to understand the natural factors because uh, one of the key uncertainties in models, for example, that we use is factoring in the El Nino self oscillation and those uh, uh, decadal um, uh, drivers. This is what the greenhouse uh, gases in 2017. Um, we already now in four or five parts per million. Um, so it's way over the three uh, 55 that we started off, you know, when we started off the negotiations back in 1990. Um, and this morning we were, were coming in on the tube and one of the lawyers that was helping us, she was asking me about, you know, is it to do with human activities or is it to do with what, what, what you understand because we want to raise some um, liability cases. And I say, oh, maybe I should, so I fold this graphic in and can you play that one? very quickly. So this is not part of the State of the Environment Report, but I just put it in the link here so that people can understand about the role of uh, the greenhouse gases. And this is really, really well done. Um, um, it based on the AR5 uh, data. Because, you know, that's the big question. It's what's really warming the world. And there's always debate about whether it's natural variability or human induced climate change. Um, just give you. So it's really good, easy sort of like graphics to clearly show how it works. Keep, keep going, please. Uh, we're running out of time. There's a lot of monitoring data going into uh, pulling that all together.
Okay, so it's definitely both human-induced and natural variability. The issue of attribution is the most difficult one, and that's where us in the scientific community will never give you whether it's 1.5 a specific number, because it's always the uncertainties, but we can give you a range of options. So we don't prescribe it. That's the role of policymakers. Um, for us, it's just giving you the, the relevant advice. That's, we already covered that. Uh, so here it is what happened in 2017. For uh, surface temperature, you can see the darker colors. That's just warming uh, compared to, you know, like the very gray light colors. And it's very obvious, you know, the polar regions are warming up very quickly, particularly if you look at Russia, it's a big, and looking at over in um, North America. Um, this is, I just used this to compare what happened in 2017 and what happened if you use that baseline. Uh, this is sea level rise. Again, you're looking, the, the one that is colored uh, blue, um, those are the ones that is uh, increased, and then the other one is sort of like um, decreasing in terms of um, um, the rise. And this do again, like for example, the El Nino South and oscillation play a key role because when the warm pools move to the east of the dateline, then if you're sitting on, on the western side, it's low. Uh, the sea level over time, so we already seen that. Um, this is ocean. This is really critical for small island states or large ocean states, uh, the role of the ocean. Um, what we did calculate the um, um, carbon budget, and there's a huge missing component. And basically, the ocean has taken more than its fair share. Um, so this is over time, and this is what the uptake of human-induced carbon in 2017. Um, ocean chaps is one of the, the, the most worrying concerns, of course, is coral reefs, uh, and the next talk we'll talk about that, so I'm not going to go over that. Um, one of the really standout in 2017 is the extreme precipitation all across the region. And uh, I've been given the signal, time is up, so I'll just skip through. Humidity is also going up, which is why you, you feel really yucky uh, in your summer. Um, tropical cyclone is really critical for a lot of the small island states. As I said, the El Nino South and Oscillation determine a lot of cyclone formation in our region and vice versa. So there's a tele-connection uh, between the different uh, oceans. So for example, what goes on in the Pacific is drive what's going on in the North Atlantic Ocean and vice versa. So what we've seen in the data and, uh, is when, when it's high um, frequency in, in our part of the world is low in the North, uh, North Atlantic, for example, and vice versa. For more information, go in there. I'll finish with uh, some observation. I was fortunate back in 1990 at the Second World Climate Conference uh, in Berlin, and Margaret Thatcher was really the champion there. Um, and we were drawing up the um, AOSIS principle as part of the lead up to the negotiation. And uh, what was fascinating for me over the years, those remains the same. Um, so when I went back to the negotiations, I spent from 1990 until 2000 and 2002, and then I dropped out. I was tired, burnt out, went back in the Paris negotiation and the last two ones. What is amazing to me is it's just the same issues that I've been aware of. Uh, back in 1990, but rephrased in a different words. So for example, we have a tough time in 1995 at COP1 in Berlin, um, getting an agreement on the joint implementation. So we very smartly turned it around and called activities implemented jointly, and then there was a pass. Um, so it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, the other thing is, is um, the Alliance of Small Island States position on climate change pact we developed. Uh, so we have six principles. Should be based on science, uh, legally binding um, greenhouse gas emissions, target and timetables, but there was no sort of like period, you know, the deadline, what target you're going for. Uh, should be fast track development of uh, technologies for renewable energy and energy efficiency, application of the precautionary principle, 
recognition of the common but differentiated responsibility based on historical emissions and the right to develop. In terms of um, the US, for example, was fascinating for me because by 2001, uh, when Bush pulled out, the only thing that we have in common is our base on science. <laughs> so on that note, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that exceptional overview, which shows just how much we do know. The question is whether or not we can apply it. So I pass immediately over to Johanne. Thank you. Okay. Can I use this one? Good morning, everybody. <laughs> so waiting for my slides to come up. Um, well, I, I've, for those of you who, who, the many of you who do not know me, um, I am a biologist by training and have worked for 30 years about in fisheries biology, first as a scientist, and then since about 20 years in international governance regarding, related to the ocean first and Eurogoose was uh, located in Southampton, <laughs> so that, that was an interesting experience. And then later in regional fisheries management organizations and also FIO from the United Nations. So just for my background. And today I'm going to talk about ocean threats and ocean governance, a match or mismatch, and I apologize, I'm not a lawyer. So what you will see here is a bit like a natural scientist perspective on, um, on a legal system and um, maybe a, a pragmatic view of solutions. So I would like to start with an um, advice that I got from my husband. He said, Johanna, you have to start with a catchy slide so to ensure that people are interested in what you have to say. So here is a catchy caption and a catchy image of an illegal fishing vessel that was caught in Thailand and is being destroyed by the authorities. It can be taken as a symbol for current efforts to close the high seas to fishing. And the big question is, can the oceans be saved by stopping all fishing on the high seas? So here's what you can expect from uh, this presentation. I'll start with uh, some insights into how life is distributed in the oceans and outline the major threats to the oceans. This is followed by a brief overview of ocean governance and the role of regional fisheries management organizations in this regard. And finally, a touch on the new UN convention that um, uh, my colleague Eden talked about this morning um, that the BBNJ Convention for the High Seas and draw some conclusions as to what the focus on of ocean conservation might be, uh, should be could be. Okay. Uh, before addressing some ecological facts, again drawing also on some thoughts of this morning, let me remind you of the UN Maritime Zones, who define the jurisdictional power over the ocean. So uh, for the purpose of my presentation, two zones are of importance. Um, that's the e uh, exclusive economic zone that um, extends to 200 nautical miles, uh, miles from the coastline. And biological resources in this zone are managed by the uh, coastal state who, who has uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, so nationally. Um, the second zone is the high seas. Um, that is defined as the areas beyond the EEZ. And then we also have the so-called ABNJs, the areas beyond national jurisdictions that include the high seas but exclude the seabeds on the uh, continental shelf beyond 200 miles if they have been declared, et cetera, et cetera, for the seabed um, authority. So this is a map of the ocean depicting the high seas in light blue and the exclusive economic zones in dark blue. So most of the ocean area, over 60%, are outside national jurisdiction in the high seas. Also, the oceans are very deep. Over 
of the oceans are deeper than 2,000 meters. And that is the maximum depth at which currently fishing can occur and probably in the foreseeable future also. The deep ocean floors are located in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And very few of these have been explored. The water pressure is extremely high and submersibles that are able to reach uh, such depths are really expensive and hard to come by. So um, this is a map of the ocean's phytoplankton distribution. The purple and dark areas indicate areas that are virtually devoid of phytoplankton, whereas the light green and yellow areas show high concentrations of phytoplankton. So you can see in this graph that it is along the nutrient-rich coast that most of the primary ocean productivity takes place, and the waters here at the coasts are therefore teeming with life. This map illustrates the sea floor, that seafloor that sea floor biomass because the phytoplankton is at the surface of the water. So the sea floor biomass also concentrates near the coasts, the yellow areas, um, and not in the high seas where the primary productivity is low, that is the blue areas. So although most ocean areas are beyond national jurisdiction, Marine life concentrates along the coasts in areas under national jurisdiction and must be protected by national laws. Consequently, almost all fishery catches, it is about 96%, are taken in areas under national jurisdiction and require national fisheries management. Let us now have a look at the main threats to the ocean. As Pene, well, <laughs> as Pene very well knows, I think climate and the climate change poses the acute, acute stress for all the ocean ecosystems and probably is the most prominent threat to the ocean through the warming and acidification effects of the seawater as well as the modification of ocean currents. Ocean currents are important to transport life from one location in the ocean to another, um, a life that does not swim on its own devices. It's plankton, lar fish larvae, that type of thing, nutrients. We also have human activities, those of course that do not already lead to climate change, um, such as um, the, the polluting the uh, oceans, with organic and uh, toxic chemicals, also with garbage, including plastics, that are distributed uh, through winds and, and currents, and also by ingestion um, uh, by uh, marine animals. Uh, we have overfishing and uh, destructive fishing practices, such as bottom tra uh, trawling or drift netting that affect uh, habitats. Um, the same is true for seabed mining, and finally, intense marine aquaculture can be quite harmful. So the impacts of all these threats to marine life can already be observed, especially in coastal waters and on the continental shelf. And they consist in the loss of habitats and biodiversity, the changes in species composition, uh, distribution shift of species towards the poles and the decline of marine population and coral reef bleaching. We all know these things. So how is governance responding to these threats and uh, this uh, situation? Um, let us start with ocean governance in areas under national jurisdiction. And um, <laughs> there are some um, best practices established also in a lot of international agreement and by FIO, uh, and uh, these include, for example, that um, good ocean governance should include cooperative planning and decision making by relevant agencies that should have a good data collection and assessment component. There should be a monitoring and enforcement of any regulations, and uh, it should include all the stakeholders in, at all levels. Now, ocean governance is costly, and uh, it must cover the coast and the 200 
miles exclusive economic zone. And uh, this is a challenge for many coastal states, especially for the over 100 developing states among the coastal states. And just to summarize a very complex um, um, issue, the, the challenges uh, consist mainly in lack of funds and, and technical know-how, uh, incomplete data, inadequate legislation, poor enforcement, enforcement can be really expensive, a limited cooperation and coordination of government activities in, inside the country, unresolved conflicts, and also lacking participation of stakeholders. Looking at the high seas governance, there are a great number of international agreements in place. The most important and overarching treaty is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, already mentioned this morning. Um, it was signed by 182 states, that's 94% of the UN members, and it was ratified by 168 states, that's 87% of the UN members. Well, other treaties um, deal with the jurisdictional powers over international ocean affairs. Um, that's the uh, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and the International Court of Justice. You have uh, conventions and institutions that address the major threats to the oceans. For example, the UNFCCC advises with regard to climate change, the International Seabed Authority regulates mining. The International Maritime Organization looks after transport and vessel-based pollution. There are also several conventions and organizations responsible for issues related to ocean conservation, biodiversity, and vulnerable species. And finally, High seas uh, fisheries have been addressed by a number of treaties, with FIO having established itself as a leading global institution for knowledge and normative guidance related to fisheries. Regional cooperation is a key mechanism for the effective implementation of international legal instruments and for the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans. So good governance of the high seas cannot be achieved by states acting individually. Through regional cooperation, actions are often taken um, faster and more efficiently than by institutions at the national level and, uh, and international level. So regional organizations are playing an important role in the introduction of best practices with benefits to national ocean management. There are numerous regional treaties and organizations providing management and advice with regard to ocean governance. Overfishing has been identified as a serious threat to the oceans. In its most recent report, just two months ago, uh, on the state of world fisheries and aquaculture, FIO has shown that about one-third of the wild fisheries resources are being overfished. Therefore, some, uh, uh, therefore, sound fisheries management is one of the most important areas to address in ocean governance, and the following slides will provide a brief overview of the international efforts in that regard. So regional fisheries management organizations, or RFMOs, are the main instruments for sustainable fisheries in the high seas. RFMOs can be divided into those with general responsibilities and specialized ones, for example, the well-known tuna RFMOs. So this shows the convention area of the five tuna RFMOs that cover really the entire high seas where tuna occur. Tuna are highly migratory species and uh, have great financial value and thus suffer from enormous fishing pressure. Tuna organizations have not always been able to implement best practices and have been criticized for allowing some tuna species to be heavily overfished. General RFMOs address non-highly migratory species in, in the high seas and in stratting stocks. 
Most high seas areas are now covered by an RFMO, except in the central, the white spots that you see there, central and southwest Atlantic, uh, the Northeast Indian Ocean, and some parts of the Central Pacific. So the following slides will focus on the functioning of general RFMOs because of their broader mandate and their potential role in a future ocean governance. So general RFMOs have responsibilities for species in the high seas, including invertebrates and non-fishery species. They regard fishing as, an as any type of activity that could result in the taking of species under their responsibility or that supports the taking of such species. So even selling somebody at the sea, if, if, if you would sell a fishing vessel a food, it would be regarded as fishing. <laughs> um, the mandate, consequently, is very broad. It is noteworthy that the convention of all general RFMOs includes either implicitly or explicitly a commitment for biodiversity conservation and for the ecosystem approach to fisheries management. So typically, a uh, general RFMO is composed of the main decision-making body, the commission, and then several sub-bodies, which are mandated to elaborate the scientific advice, to review the effectiveness of measures and compliance, and to advise on budgetary and procedural matters. They have a secretariat that provides year-round information coordination administration services. All RFMOs usually have a large and complex array of different measures. SPRIFMO, for example, has 16 conservation and management measures, although it is a rather recent organization, just five years old. And to be effective, fisheries measures have to be enforced. We said that before. So for the purpose um, of enforcement, general RFMOs have adopted numerous measures for the monitoring, control, and surveillance of the fisheries, as well as assessing the compliance of member states with the measures. So in the case of SPRIFMO, that is the example you are just seeing, about two-thirds of the measures are dedicated to this end. Um, the vessel monitoring system, for example, that's uh, well known, is an important tool to monitor the movements of vessels in the convention area using an hourly or so transmission of positions via satellite. Other common MCS tools are inspections at sea and in ports, observe on board a vessel, air surveys, and others. The fight against illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing is um, important to all RFMOs, and they all have developed so-called IUU blacklists. Vessels that have been blacklisted face severe penalties. They generally lose their fishing permits for the area, they will not receive any support from other vessels, they will not be allowed to enter any ports from other flags, and they will not be granted another flag and cannot trade their catch um, uh, with, uh, yeah, cannot trade the catch. Uh, our families cooperate with regard to their IUU lists. Right, I'm almost coming to the end, um, there have been expressed deep concerns over destructive bottom fishing of vulnerable ecosystems on sea mounts in the high seas. So general RFMOs have recognized the issue and taken a number of measures to protect these ecosystems. So far, uh, general RFMOs have closed most of the sea mounts in their areas to bottom fishing. In a recent review by FIO, it is summarized that 77% of the IBNJ is managed by RFMOs, and that 5% of that area is potentially fishable, and of that 5%, 76% is closed to bottom fishing. Also, um, this report concluded that it is clear that uh, deep sea fisheries are being progressively managed according to an ecosystem approach to fisheries and that it is expected that this will continue in the future. Oh, sorry. Should I? Right. So in summary, um, it should be noted that general RFMOs provide governance in the high seas. Yes, they can improve 
but there is substantial means, substantial funds going into making them work. Promote international ocean cooperation, establish best practices with benefits for coastal fisheries management of developing states that are members, offer a forum for coastal states to co address their concerns, issues, and achievements, lend support for capacity development of coastal states, are mandated to protect ecosystems and biodiversity, monitor compliance and sanction non-compliance, and perform regular reviews of their effectiveness. So will the new convention that you talked about this morning, <laughs> Eden, will that um, maybe even close the high seas to fishing, and will it thus save the oceans? And I'm not saying that it is unnecessary. I'm just saying, will it achieve that particular objective? So I'm not going into it because Eden covered it, but I would like to mention that uh, there are many who place high hopes on this new convention, and um, th there are also efforts um, to close the high seas to fishing altogether. This is not something that the convention is cur currently considering, but it certainly could be an element that uh, uh, could come about once you have this convention in place. So what would that mean? Could, that, um, could a stop of high seas fishing really substantially contribute to saving the oceans? There are a number of potential benefits. For example, highly migratory pelagic species, species tunas would be safer in international waters. Currently fished, vulnerable marine ecosystems in the high seas would have a chance to regenerate. There are very few of them, but they would no longer be fished. The economic impact has been shown to be low if you stop fishing in the high seas. So that because the catches, as we have seen, are very low, and fishing in the high seas is very expensive. However, there are some risks that I would like to ha highlight. Fisheries in the high seas provide an important incentive for regional cooperation through RFMOs. Without RFMOs, a vital tool for the promotion of best practices will be lost. Without RFMOs, also scientific sampling in the high seas will be reduced. And without RFMOs, the monitoring, control, and surveillance in the high seas will be jeopardized, the currently existing system. And without monitoring, control, and surveillance, there is a high risk of increased illegal fishing. OK, so in summary, climate change uh, poses the biggest threat to the oceans, and we are addressing it, I hope. <laughs> Non-climate ocean threats derive mainly from land-based or coastal activities. The national ocean governance varies, and uh, many countries face severe difficulties with the implementation of sound management regimes. Regional fishery cooperation in the high seas is functional, has legal authority, provides for monitoring, control, and surveillance, and strives to implement best management practices. So closing the high seas to fishing could diminish vital regional ocean cooperation. Therefore, in conclusion, I would like to say that we've seen the existing international ocean governance is comprehensive, and I believe that it has the potential to adequately address threats from marine activities in the high seas. I do not know if a new convention is necessary, but I'm certainly not opposing it. Uh, I, I just think we, you know, we have to, to, to improve what we have. Um, Land-based and coastal threats to the oceans are significant, and effective cons ocean conservation must focus on supporting national efforts and finding solutions. And then regional cooperation encourages the national implementation of best practices and should continue. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we are now experts in the climate and the ocean. And to close this panel, please, Jose. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jose Mata. I'm a lawyer at the Brussels Bar, and it's my pleasure to be uh, today with you to talk about um, the Estocol Convention on the use of blockchain to boost climate action. 
uh, the structure of my presentation, the, 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 of my presentation, will be the following one. I will explain first what's what's that, what that, uh, what's uh, the preliminary, the preliminary Stockholm, uh, Stockholm Convention on the use of blockchain to boost climate action. Sec secondly, I will highlight the most innovative provisions of uh, this convention. And I will just uh, finish the presentation with a um, brief reference to the document, the 10 signs most know on climate change, which was presented to the Secretary of the United Nations Framework climate, um, Convention on Climate Change uh, last November uh, in Bonn. So first, uh, the, 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 the convention is a result of uh, a competition who was uh, organized by the Stockholm uh, Chamber of Commerce in partnership with other organizations, the, the purpose of which was to draft uh, a model treaty with the highest potential to encourage uh, foreign investment in uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, complying with uh, 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 five assess assessment uh, criteria. Uh, first, compatibility. It should be compatible with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable, sustainable Development Goal. First, efficacy. Uh, it should lead to a significant increase in green investments related to climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. Viability, likely to be adopted by country, uh, countries around the world, states around the world. Universality that there, the provisions of the convention could be uh, implemented by, let's say, in the context of today's conference, small countries as well, and enforceability, uh, leading to binding uh, decisions, uh, leading to widening decisions. Well, uh, it must be said it was a treaty lab, so it didn't follow the whole procedure that usually a, conver a convention follows before we end to the final results. So uh, it is partially the reason why uh, it is uh, something which is still uh, on, the, on, on the process. Uh, actually, we are work working on an special edition. Um, of the Journal of International Arbitration, where all these ideas uh, that emerged uh, within the context will be exposed. Uh, that leads me to the second point of my presentation, the, mm, the most innovative uh, ideas of, of the convention. Uh, namely, there were uh, a climate change international investment plan uh, a system and a, a climate accountability system, and the proposal of a WTO consistent border adjust, adjustment carbon tax coupled with a labeling scheme of carbo, carbon footprints. Uh, all of these uh, may have a different uh, ending depending on the approach that we take to the treaty. If you go for a real treaty, then there may be um, possible conflict with other international investment agreements uh, that may justify to adopt something like the opt-in clause uh, proposed by the Mauritius Convention for the Application of the UNCITRAL Rules on Transparency in Treaty-Based Investment State Arbitration. Uh, but on the other hand, if we go for a model treaty, just for a, like the model, a model treaty, there, then the cost will be the lack of, probably the lack of uh, uniformity or harmonization in, in, in the regulation. The first, the, the, the first point is uh, the first most innovative uh, measure, as I said, is a climate change investment plan. Uh, which uh, that has as a starting point the proposal for states to implement uh, ECOS. ECOS is uh, the acronym for uh, initial coin offering, and it um, equates what we what is um, known uh, known as IPOS, but in the blockchain version, initial public offering. So. Uh, an, an ICO 
ends being something like an initial public offering, which bring the states to collect money for a green investment project in a much, uh, in a more, uh, uh, how to say, in a, in a more uh, easy way. That there is no need to make a, a, a prospectus. We, here we go work with uh, white papers, white papers. Uh, but there is the need, there is a clear need to pass legislation to, to, to be offered, to, to, to have the possibility to offer investors cent certainty, a, a certain level of certainty and protection for their investments in the same way that it has been done, for instance, in other jurisdictions. In the United States, you have uh, Delaware, you have Arizona, you have, you have Tennessee. Uh, where uh, the implementation of ICOs through the use of uh, smart contracts uh, does um, do have a legal effect because there is a legislation that contemplates uh, smart contracts. Okay, uh, what a smart contract is? Well, a smart contract is an automated algorithm with self-capacity uh, to enforce and execute uh, a decision. Um, okay, so we put the focus on uh, on the protection of the of the green investment rather than in the link of um, of the convention with the citizenship of a national of a, of a member state. So we propose here a change of focus. Um, and we replicate, this is uh, one of the things that make the proposal innovative, the whole European investment plan, but uh, using uh, blockchain. So we end up with a uh, structure which uh, offer um, a new form of global gov governance. Um, the, 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 the second most innovative uh, proportion, as I said, is the system. It's a system of uh, climate accountability. Uh, basically, is uh, the, propos the proposition to, to take satellite pictures fr from the space uh, that allows, uh, through the use of big data, to, to analyze uh, the emission of greenhouse uh, gases. Uh, if this is done, then, um, then that, will, that will enhance the transparency of the system and particularly in the view of uh, intended national determinate contributions, which are the base of the uh, uh, of the binding uh, of the climate change agreements after uh, 2020 it will also help in terms of evidence collecting evidence uh, because of the very nature of blockchain uh, which is unmutable and uh, the third one uh, in the third most innovative uh, proposal is the, um, the proposition of a WTO consistent border adjustment carbon tax um, coupled with a labeling scheme, a scheme of a carbon footprint. It should be in order to work non-discriminatory. Uh, it should abide to technical barriers to trade, WTO technical barriers to trade. Uh, it will work in a similar way to the value-added uh, tax in the sense that uh, once you have paid the tax in, uh, in a country for a pr product you, 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 you have produced it uh, and you export that, that product, you will, get the you will get a reimbursement, okay? Um, to avoid do do double taxations in other parties, parties states of the convention and in the assumption that, um, that uh, all the party states of the convention, for instance, the party states of the Paris Agreement, adopt this, uh, this measure, okay? Uh, and I will end because um, I compromised myself to give uh, <laughs> the speech in, 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 in 10 minutes. With uh, the reference to the most, uh, the ten uh, science most knows on, on, on climate change, uh, it is certain. Uh, it has been scientifically proven that we have a carbon budget 
that we, if we the, uh, overpass, then uh, we have uh, a high risk of exceeding the two degrees Celsius targets of the, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, many of the statements, I will not list the 10 statements that uh, were listed in, in the document, but some of them uh, refer to the increase of acidity uh, in the oceans, uh, the increase of sea levels, uh, risks associated with uh, exacerbated migration, and uh, also with processes that will have to lead with, even if we reach the goals of, of, of the Paris Agreement, because there are process, processes that are already uh, on, on, on the way. So the conclusion is that uh, climate change is, uh, the conclusion of the, the last point of my presentation is that climate change is a, uh, is a typical, is a classical example of the tragedies of the, of the, tragedies of the common because uh, not only small states are uh, fragile, we, we, we all are fragile. Again, the threat of climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. So useful to see that we can take our knowledge in the science and apply it for law, for monitoring, for governance.